Jacqueline Cock. I'm a professor of sociology at uh, um, the University of the Witwatersrand. And I'm very, very um, pleased and honored to have this opportunity. What I want to stress, comrades, is the importance of the work you are doing because the stakes are very, very high. They are quite simply survival, not just human survival, but the survival of all life forms on Earth. Because if we cannot defeat the power of the fossil fuel corporations, we are going to see an increasing process of ecological collapse leading to ecological catastrophe. And of course, Africa is going to be the worst affected. And that is extremely unjust because Africa emits a total of 4% of global carbon emissions and yet is suffering, and it's not future tense, it's present tense, is suffering the worst impacts of ecological deterioration generally, because it's not only the climate crisis, it's also the kind of land degradation and um, pollution that's happening through the process of extractivism, which is the new uh, neo-colonial assault on Africa. So there are very, very important issues here, and I think it's up to people like you and people like me to help as much as we can to really mobilize against a very, very serious threat that all humanity is facing. And I want to stress that this is something which we need to do together. And I want to make a very simple message to you. And the message is that we are in a crisis, survival is threatened, and the only way out of this crisis is to build a eco-feminist socialist movement. Because what is happening at present is that everyone, even the fossil fuel corporations, agree that we need to change. But there is absolutely no uh, consensus about either the depth or the direction of that change. So the notion of a just transition is very contested and there are very powerful forces which are trying to block fundamental change. And that's summed up in the concept of the green economy. Because the green economy has been described as a wolf in sheep's clothing. And the wolf is neoliberal capitalism. And what, what the green economy is trying to do is to block fundamental change by uh, small adjustments in the name of sustainability. And there's a way, there's a very real sense in which sustainability has been captured by elite interests and who, who fail to link it to the whole issue of justice. But the core of the green economy is the idea of commodifying nature, reducing nature to what they call natural capital, whereby everything can be bought and sold. And of course, it is the poor, and especially the poor of Africa, who are dispossessed and denied access to clean water, clean air, nutritious food, everything that we as human beings need in order to survive. In fact, the green economy is going even further, talking about the financialization of nature through creating um, payments for ecosystem services, carbon trading, biodiversity bonds. These are all ways in which the powerful and wealthy of the world are trying to make profit out of the climate crisis. And the wealthy and powerful of the world are not only the 1%, they include a larger set of forces, such as many government leaders, many politicians, as well as corporate executives and philanthropists who often are promoting narrow interests rather than the interests of the majority. So what would an eco-feminist future look like? And again, I want to stress that there's no blueprint, but I think there are a couple of characteristics which are important and which might resonate with your experiences and understandings. And this is where I'm really sad that we can't have an interaction. And the first, the first I think, principle of what an eco-feminist socialist 
society would look like is that there would be real equality, not the formal equality that we read about in terms of rights and um, which are often empty and formal, but real equality in the sense of having access, equal access to the resources that we need. And this idea of equality is of course deeply, deeply embedded in the tradition of socialism. And people often dismiss socialism because of the failed economic policies and the human rights abuses of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. So when I talk about socialism, I'm wanting us to have in mind a new kind of socialism, a socialism that is democratic, that is ecological, and that is ethical, and that allows for diversity and freedom of expression and organization. And I think this can be, there, there are two routes, two ways which we can try to persuade people of the need for a socialist future whereby natural resources are all socially owned and democratically controlled. That is the only way we can break the present sort of class polarization, which means that there's a widening gap between the very rich and the very poor. That's one of the most dramatic characteristics of the world we live in. There are two things. The one is the move to ecological collapse and possibly catastrophe, and the other is deepening social inequality. And both are products of neoliberal capitalism, and both require a totally alternative form of social organization and mobilization. Feminism has been, if you like, captured by neoliberalism. It's been reduced to issues of representation, of getting more women into positions of power and authority, either in government or in the private sector. The feminist tradition is for collective empowerment rather than individual advancement. And so the women who are intent on making it, making it for themselves, are simply reflecting the individualism, the competitiveness, the materialism of neoliberal capitalism. And that's what we have to, what we have to struggle against. So I would see a very strong uh, connection between feminist notions of solidarity, feminist notions of how the enemy is not men, the enemy is not even patriarchy, meaning the power of men. The enemy is a combination of capitalism and patriarchy. It is a form of domination which extends into the most intimate areas of our lives, such as our sexuality and our reproductive choices. And it's these two ideas, I think, that, that make for a connection, a convergence, if you like, between feminism and socialism. Firstly, the idea of solidarity, of standing together. And secondly, the idea that we have to fight against domination and oppression in all its forms. But the connection between patriarchy and capitalism is a particular strong one. So I'm trying to move towards the notion that there are grounds on which we can mobilize, which connect with people's experiences, their concrete experiences. I found in working with the labor movement, and um, I've been involved with Kusatu on environmental education work for some years now. But what I found is that when you talk about climate change, it seems very remote and abstract to people. You have to bring it down to concrete issues, especially food prices. This is something that everybody, or all working class and, and people can, uh, can unite around. And it's a way of making um, what could be seen as remote and abstract climate change real and immediate. So when we're talking about food, of course, we're talking very largely about women's work because it's women who have the responsibility, especially in Africa, both for the production of food and for the preparation of food. And that brings us to the next set of allies or if you like, set of ideas that I think we can build upon to try and mobilize people for an eco-feminist socialist agenda. 
And I want to repeat what I said earlier, that this is our only chance of survival. Everything else is picking up the pieces without trying to stop the breakage. This is what we need to go forward. This is what we need to survive at all. But when it comes to the environmental movement, there are difficulties. And some of you might recognize uh, what I want to say about the South African experience, which is that to some extent, environmentalism is a contaminated idea, similar to feminism. Feminism is being contaminated by being reduced to questions of representation rather than transformation. I'm really, really sad that I'm, that I'm, not, that I'm not with you because one of the things I'd really like us to exchange and, and discuss together is how to identify the enemy. Because only when we've done that really clearly can we talk about how to build solidarity and the kind of movement that I'm proposing, an eco-feminist socialist movement. Often in environmental circles, people talk about the enemy as fossil fuel capitalism. In other words, the problem is a particular energy regime. And if we can overcome that regime and keep the oil in the soil and the coal in the hole, then we will achieve a just and sustainable future. And I want to raise a question about that because extractivism is deeply, deeply embedded in a particular kind of capitalism, which I would call neoliberal capitalism. And that is characterized not only by its tendency to exploit and ignore human needs and human interests, but also it's characterized by this intense individualism, a kind of privatization, not only of businesses, but of social relations. Because if you look at what's happening um, around us in Africa and in Europe, especially with the migrant crisis, and by the way, the mi what's happening in Europe now is a foretaste of what is going to come with the number of climate refugees that are going to be forced to leave Africa as the continent becomes much, many parts of the continent are going to become uninhabitable with temperature degrees now predicted to be between six and seven degrees. So when you watch on television what's happening with the, um, with the treatment of refugees from Syria and the conflict there, which is also related to climate change, by the way, but that's another story. It's something of a indicator of what is going to come for us in Africa unless we mobilize. I think we need to be mobilizing against neoliberal capitalism in the way it generates values of competition and individualism. Because to build a movement, we have to recognize that as individuals, we are powerless. It is only by coming together that we can be strong. And in coming together, I think there's one particular issue as women, as rural and urban women, we can really speak in a way people can hear us. And that is the issue of food and of food sovereignty. The present system of the present food regime is deeply unjust. In South Africa, 53% of the population, that's over half the population, and, the, and this is an official government statistic. Over half the population report in a survey that they experience hunger either on a regular basis or a, an occasional basis. And at the same time that you have hunger, you have incredible wastage of food. A third of all the food we produce in South Africa gets wasted. And then the third factor in this context is the extravagant overconsumption on the part of the elite. Food is an issue which is not only unjust, it's also unsustainable, and that is the way industrial agriculture relies on, uh, on, on um, pesticides and chemicals which are fossil fuel based, and on fossil fuels itself in the long food miles that many food items travel from where they are produced to where they're consumed. 
And the food regime, the food system needs to change because we need to challenge the way it is dominated by a few. There are 10 corporations which control the global food system and their power is increasing and their power is, is very difficult to challenge. And another way in which the food system is problematic is that the spread of geo, ge, genetically modified food. For example, South Africa is the only country in the world that is allowed for a staple food, that's maize in our case, to be genetically modified. 98% of our maize is now GMO. So we can see all these kinds of uh, ways, or the many other ways, in which the food system is unsafe, unjust, unsustainable, and unsafe. Unsafe for many people throughout Africa in the way many highly processed foods are full of toxic chemicals and high additives in, coming from sugar and salt, all of which uh, generate ill health. So food is an issue which I think if we're talking about building a movement and building solidarity, it is something which connects with our everyday experience. There's nothing more basic which affects everybody than food. And there's nothing which more powerfully illustrates the inequalities in the world, the growing inequalities between the rich and the poor, between the wealthy and the, and the deprived. So, in doing so, in building solidarity and building movements, a movement, a specifically um, eco-feminist socialist movement, I think we have to pay attention to people's everyday needs and experiences. And this is where the kind of mobilization that Samantha and Connie have been uh, telling me is happening right now in this event is incredibly important because we have to organize differently. We as feminists or as women working together, you might and not all of you might want to claim the identity of feminists yet, that I would hope you do in the future. We have to practice a different kind of solidarity that is based on sharing, sharing resources, and I don't only mean money there, I mean sharing our knowledge, our ideas, our time, our thoughts, and our voices. It also means we, have to, we should, right now, be trying to live the future by living simply, by living, uh, the Latin America, the people from South America talk about living well rather than living better. Living better is at other people's expense, wanting to have more than the next person. Living well means everybody having access to the resources that they need. And we need to be practicing, very important, we need to be practicing respect and a kind of dialogic learning by listening to each other's experiences and practicing a participatory democracy, not a representative democracy which involves voting occasionally and then trusting to our representatives in parliament. So this idea of human rights and participatory democracy is one of, the, they are two of the key principles or values we can point to if we can start thinking about a compass for change. The blueprint of an eco-feminist socialist society has to be the product of this process of democratizing the debate about a just transition. It has to be the outcome of a process of intense and widespread debate, learning from each other, sharing experiences, building each other's capacity uh, for change, uh, changing ourselves because change has to happen at every level. And I think this is the way forward. And I want to end by giving you a message of solidarity. Um, I hope you haven't fallen asleep. I can't see it, so maybe you have fallen asleep listening to me. But I hope that at least you'll think about these, these notions of feminism, of environmentalism, and of socialism, and how they can strengthen the struggle in which the wonderful and crucially important struggle in which all of you are engaged and for which I have enormous respect and admiration. Thank you.